Today's episode of Dong is one you fried dough convection wanna miss. We're gonna be squaring a donut. Now I know what you might be thinking. Donut, uh, where's the nut? I mean, I see the dough, but why dough nut? Well, as it turns out, when fried dough confections were first made, they didn't look like this. They looked like this, little balls. And one sense of the word nut, especially back in the day, was a small round thing, a nut. So this was called a donut, which means that this gets its name from this. The donut hole, as we call it today, predates the donut. So in a way, this is all an allegory for the human condition. We have in our centers an emptiness, and we've decided to give that a name. And we've pretended like it's a leftover thing, it's unimportant, when in reality, our very name, our very existence, comes from that emptiness we no longer have. Mmm. Oh, the old fashioned is my favorite. But before we square a donut, we need to square a square. Squaring the square is a problem, a puzzle that asks, can you tile a square with squares? Right here, I have a square that is 16 units by 16 units. One way to tile this with squares is to simply cut it in half, like this, and cut it in half again. Ta-da, I have squared this square. Each one of these squares has a side length of eight, and there you go. Problem solved, challenge completed. A squared square. And as always, thanks for watching again. <laughs> We've only just started. This is a pretty uninteresting result. It's trivial. Take a look at this squared square. This squared square has 90 degree rotational symmetry, which is just fantastic. The layout of squares is the same whether you look at it at any of these four 90 degree rotations. However, even something as beautiful as this is not perfect. This is a squared square, but it's imperfect. A perfect squared square is a square tiled with squares such that all the squares inside have different side lengths. Here, we've got, you know, four squares with side length four, we've got four with side length three, four with side length two, and five with side length one, not perfect. Now, Numberphile has a fantastic video about the history of this problem. It wasn't really even tackled until the 1930s at Cambridge University, although it might feel like some kind of ancient Greek mathematical trouble. It's actually quite recent, which is very exciting. The very first perfect squared square discovered was discovered in 1939 by Roland Sprague, and this is it. Every single one of the squares inside this larger square has a unique side length, but it is compound. This is a compound perfect squared square. What does compound mean? Well, compound means that some of the squares inside the largest square form a square themselves or a rectangle. In fact, this is all color coded. Right here, all of these sort of yellow, almost orangish, and some of the pinkish squares make a rectangle. We've got a rectangle here. We've got rectangles all throughout, which means this is a compound perfect squared square. So the real question becomes, can you square a square perfectly, but not compoundly? Meaning, can you tile a square with squares whose side lengths are all different, and also not make a square or rectangle inside the actual largest square? <laughs> well, that is a lot more difficult. Or is it? Well, kind of, except not really because if a perfect squared square is not compound, it is simple. Simple means that no grouping of squares inside the square form squares or rectangles themselves. It can be done. Now, this entire episode was inspired by this puzzle that I received from Omega Dot out of Australia. What a beautiful puzzle. This was sent right to our PO box, which you can use to also send me free stuff. Cha-ching. This, however, is not 
a squared square. It is a squared rectangle, which is still quite interesting. This is called Stone's Simple Perfect Squared Rectangle. Mathematician Arthur Howard Stone was the discoverer of this particular uh, simple perfect squared rectangle. It's called an anisosqueric rectangle, where aniso means unequal. The squares are all unequal. And this is technically a rectangle. It is a little bit taller than it is wide. We have 99 plus 77 this way and 99 plus 78 this way. However, not a single grouping of any of the squares inside form a rectangle on their own or a square, and they all have different side lengths. So it is definitely simple and it's definitely perfect. Um, now, should I be showing this to you already solved? Well, I feel a little bit bad. You could just like Google it. This is kind of a old puzzle. Also, it comes in the box solved and a picture of the puzzle solved is on the box. So it's like really hard to not know how to solve this. But the point is that today I wanna to talk, how do you put this back? Ooh, ah oh, yeah, let's start the video here guys so it looks like I'm a genius. You should go check out Number File's video about squared squares and squared rectangles because it is phenomenal. But today I wanna to talk not about squaring a square, not even squaring a rectangle like this puzzle, but instead squaring a torus. What's a torus? Well, the surface of a donut is a two-dimensional torus. Meaning I'm not talking about the stuff inside the donut, only the outside, the surface. If you imagined a planet that was shaped like a donut with a hole in the middle, creatures living on its surface would be exploring and walking around and living on a two-dimensional torus. That is that surface's shape. Now, interestingly, there is a creature that lives on a torus, Pac-Man. If you've played Pac-Man, you know that on the game screen, if you go up off the top of the map, you just appear down at the bottom. And if you go too far to the right, you just appear on the left side and vice versa. That is what it's like to live on a torus on the surface of a donut. If you think about it, a creature, ooh, this one looks much nicer. That's got a nice hole right there. Hey guys, this is a thumbnail right here, huh? Whoa, mind blown. Donut is square the donut challenge. Point is, uh, Pac-Man lives on the surface of a donut, uh, topologically speaking, because if Pac-Man's here and Pac-Man goes up, what's gonna happen is that Pac-Man is gonna go into the donut back out from the bottom and come back to where he began. And if Pac-Man goes to the right, he'll circle all the way around and come back to the left. So if you could flatten the surface of a donut, you would have Pac-Man's universe. And it would in fact be a quadrilateral. Think of it this way, take a donut and cut it just like that, okay? See that cut? Now straighten it out, which I can't do with this real donut, but straighten it out into a cylinder. Here, look at this animation. Okay, now that it's a cylinder, slit it lengthwise and unroll it. Ah, how perfect. But of course, the topological properties are still going to remain, although we have flattened it. Now, what I have here <clears throat> is a square that I've drawn on a piece of paper. But it's not really a square. It's a flat two-dimensional torus. What does that mean? Well, it means I should like finally swallow it. One second. Okay, mouth is empty. This square is actually a surface that is a flat two-dimensional torus. So if I have anything on this surface and I move it up, it will appear down here. And if I move anything to the right, it will come out over here. The challenge is fitting this square and this square on our flat two-dimensional torus. Here's how we're going to do that. And by the way, this tiling of a torus was discovered a hundred years before the squaring of the square was tackled by Cambridge University. In about the 1830s, Henry Perigal discovered this tiling. And this is what you do. First of all, you take this square, and you can probably already see that it's cut into pieces, and I'm going to move it across our surface. Now, as you can tell, it can't really be there because this side is glued around to this side. So this half of the square will peak up from here. We have not, I repeat, we have not actually cut this square. 
Instead, these two edges are glued together and our original square is still whole. The next thing we're going to do is move the square this way. Now, these two pieces will have gone around the torus and they'll come out on the other side just like Pac-Man. Oh my gosh, look what we have now. We have a slot for our final square. We have a simple, perfect squaring of a donut right there. Now this was discovered in 1830, but there's an even earlier way to create a simple, perfect squared torus that's more amazing. And it was discovered in the year about 900 by Al Nairizi of Arabia. I'll show you why it's my favorite after we put it together. This is the square. I'm going, this is not a square. It looks like a square, but this is a flat two-dimensional torus that I will be tiling with these two squares. You can probably already see a bit of what I'm going to do because of where these cuts are. The first thing we're gonna do is start with this, oopsie, dropped the corner. We're gonna start with this larger square and we're going to position it on our torus like this so that this part of the square leaves what looks like an edge but actually is glued to this one goes around the torus and comes out over here. Then we're gonna move the thing down enough. You should be able to see that that corner is also not there, but it's around up here. Beautiful. Okay, now we wanna take this square and we can fit it in pretty well right there, huh? Ooh, look how beautiful this is. This line on our torus goes around and comes back like that. Again, these squares have not been cut. They are whole and they tile the surface of a donut. It's just beautiful, but it gets better. Of all the square tilings of a torus, Al Nairizi's is my favorite because it contains within it a visual proof of the Pythagorean theorem. Yeah, let's take a look at that. So here we have our tiled flat two-dimensional torus. Let us say that this side right here is length C. Well, then that means that the area of this shape right here, this white shape equals, the area is C squared. But look closely and what do you see? A right triangle, ta-da. The Pythagorean theorem tells us that C squared equals A squared plus B squared, where A and B are the other two sides of the right triangle. We have a right triangle right here, and we can decide to label them A and B. Let's call uh, this length right here. All right, let's call this one, oh, beautiful. We'll call this one A. And then the other side that is not the hypotenuse or A is B, and B is this length right here, okay? There we go, B for blue, A for pink, and C for the side of the large square. Couldn't be easier to remember. So we know that C is the side of this square, and the square's area is C squared, but what are A and B? Easy, let's put these squares back together. We will move this piece down here, and that's one of our original squares. It has side length A. Let's put this one back together, and by goodness, B is its side length. So its area is B squared. The other square's area is A squared. Combined, their areas are A squared plus B squared. And combined, their areas equal the area of the larger square, whose area is C squared. A squared plus B squared equals C squared. The Pythagorean theorem. <laughs> That's what I call the Square of the Donut Challenge. <laughs> Thank you, Al Nairizi of Arabia. Beautiful, beautiful work and such delicious work. Now I have links down below where you can play games on a torus. That's right. Why stick to a Euclidean plane when you could play a word search that wraps around in both directions? Or you can play tic-tac-toe on a torus in three dimensions. It is, ah, a tasty. They are extremely, Awesome, check those out. And as always, thanks for watching.
Oh, that's so good.